Okay. Yeah. So, uh, welcome. Today we're going to do chapter uh, 13, but before we do that, I wanted to spotlight my video and then uh, talk a little bit about the test. Uh, so the high score was 95, the low was 55, and the mean was 77. So that's pretty good, right in between. Um, you may have noticed at this point that there are some questions that I have repeated, uh, and that is intentional. Um, usually, it's the same question, but has different numbers thrown in, or some of them were exactly the same. So <clears throat> make sure you look back, and actually I'll release, um, if I don't do it, later today, remind me, I'll release the uh, answers to the questions for the first exam. Um, so you can study those. Because I do go back and I pull some of those, and especially the ones that I think are important, those are the ones that have been repeated. Um, so you can use that as a study guide going into exam four. And speaking of exam four, um, not technically a final, right? So it's worth the same number of points and the same percentage of your grade as the previous exams. Um, but if you score higher on exam four than, on, than you did on a previous exam, I will replace the previous exam score with your exam four score. So if you had one bad test, if you had you know one week out of the last three weeks, even though it feels like it's been a year, uh, technically you know three quarters of a year of content, then um, that will get replaced. So that can help your grade out. Um, pretty much everybody's doing fairly well. Uh, I'm not going to go over the test questions today. And please, you know, I don't, I don't really think anybody's cheating. Um, but there are a couple people who had some uh, highly unfortunate circumstances come up over this last weekend. And so I gave them extensions to try and so that they can take the exam. Um, so we won't, I won't be going over those questions, but you can look at and see what you got, and please don't share those. Um, I did want to make a note real quick about sort of my, I think pedagogy is the right term, pedagogy towards cheating, or my philosophy towards cheating. Um, I know a lot of professors will just get like irrationally angry that students cheat, um, I feel more like, it's like, you're not cheating me, you're cheating yourself. Uh, what are you actually accomplishing? You're just hurting yourself in the long run. Um, again, I don't really think anybody's cheating, but you know, I just wanna throw that out there. Um, also, a lot of the test questions have multiple versions, so you probably don't even have the same question. Um, let's see. Oh, I did want to say too, congratulations on making it this far. Uh, this class is not easy, and I know there's people who are working, there's people who have kids, there's people who work night shift even. Um, and that's honestly insane. And even for the people who don't have all that other stuff going on, it's a hard class. So thanks for sticking it out this far. Um, there was, I did a, uh, uh, what's the word? Equity workshop last week, which was actually really cool. Um, if you're watching this on Zoom later, uh, these links will pop up in the transcript, or they think the copy of the chat will pop up. But uh, I'll put the, these links in the video description as well. Um, Can I ask a question about the, um, about the test, or, or do you not even want to go over that? Uh, what is the question? Well, I saw there was two questions that came up. I think I got them right. I, I haven't had a chance to go back through and look at the answers yet, but it was um, about the the lowest. Um, what is it called? The when you're in the uh, that Bohr model, the lowest state, energy state. Um, that I mean, that is just when you're when you write the entire equation or whatever you know, like two S P or or what you know two P four or whatever, whatever. Yeah. The lowest energy state. That's the furthest that it goes naturally, right? So if you have like, um, I don't have my periodic in front of me, but if you have a, a, a molecule or whatever uh, that goes to all the way up to like 5P6, then that's, then, then five is going to be the lowest energy state, N5? No. 
Oh, you're you're talking about the the principal quantum number. Yes, uh, there. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. So the principal quantum number. Um, here, I'll just do this real quick. Okay. The so only the only example was hydrogen, and that's just one. So it's like that doesn't really help very much. I mean. So, so the principal quantum number, or you know, principal shell, it's the highest energy level, and that corresponds to the period that the element is in. So the first yes. row is is one. The second row is two. Right, three. N equals three. N equals four. N equals five. So like chlorine, for example, its principal quantum number would be three. Got it. Okay. That's that's what I assumed. I just wasn't sure because it was like, again, the only example is hydrogen, and that's that only has one. So I wasn't sure if it's like, because chlorine yeah. occupies one, two, and three. So, you know, I wasn't sure if it was three or if it was one. So, Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. So there, there I was looking for the um, the outer shell. Right, the highest energy level. Now my textbooks are okay. log back in. Well, yeah, the question says in its lowest energy state. Oh. And so that's what Oh. Okay, maybe I have to go back through and look at those. Um, yeah, but I mean I, I figured that it wouldn't make sense for you to be asking because every single one of them has N one. You know what I mean? So it's like it only makes sense to to mean what is its what, what like you just said chlorine is is three i mean that that right. makes sense so okay all right cool thank you okay yeah i'll have to look at those in the bank to see what the wording was exactly um let me just take a look real quick <clears throat> what is the principal uh okay maybe this is a different question that, that you're thinking of this is, says what is the principal quantum number principal shell of the following element is that not the one you're thinking of that's the one I'm thinking. And then, so I guess what, okay. I, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I probably was just trying to confuse myself, which I tend to do. So <laughs> that. You're, going, you're going to the next level. We're on level one. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, it's, it's so easy to All psych right. yourself out on this stuff because there's so much minutia. Um, yeah. So many little tiny details. Okay. All right, cool. Thank you. Yes. Okay. So, yeah, these are some these are some really cool resources. The scientist spotlight was really cool, um, just to show like not all scientists are old white dudes, um, and just to you know see what like these other people are interested in and working in, and that there's a lot of diversity, um, although it could still use improvement. The other link that I put in there um, is actually a research paper that showed how. Um, <laughs> A professor showed his students this website and had them look over it and pick somebody and do like a little report on them um, and how that improved the scores of um, really improved the scores of his students overall um, and increased engagement. Um, yeah, OK, so I just wanted to highlight those two things because I thought those were really cool. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. Where'd that go? OK. Um, I have moved, so uh, it might take a little longer for the videos to get onto YouTube before I had to go to my brother's house to upload them because he had faster upload speeds. Um, but now I don't have to wait for when I can go over to his place to upload those, and I'll just, right, as soon as it's over, I'll start uploading the video. So I'm not sure how long it's going to take right now. Um, and then I just wanted to highlight that Lab 11, uh, you have to get a passing score on Lab 11 to pass this class. It's not that crazy of, of an exam or of a, of a lab, um, but just make sure you take your time, ask me questions. Like you can send me a message and say, hey, is this, is this okay? Like, does this look good? Um, and I will help you work through it. I'm not gonna just, you know, give you the answers, but I will help you work through it and help you figure it out. Uh, Cause the understanding is more important than you doing it by yourself, uh, if that makes sense. Uh, okay. Are there any other questions? I should have Zoom up here. So I can see if there's anything in the chat. No? Okay. Then let us begin chapter 13 with solutions. Quote, I get stuck in my head. I cannot remember where I heard it. 
the solution to pollution is dilution. It's not. That's not the solution to pollution. But it rhymes, so it sounds nice. <laughs> Anyways, okay, so solutions. <clears throat> so I guess just as a little, little recap, right, let's think back to all the stuff that we've covered so far. We talked about solubility rules way back, and then we uh, learned sort of why those solubility rules exist a little bit uh, in terms of intermolecular forces, right? So if we have something, um, if you put something into water, whether it's going to dissolve or not is dependent on the intermolecular forces. If the forces of that molecule or compound or whatever you throw into the water, if those intermolecular forces between the compound are stronger than the water, then it won't be soluble. If they're weaker than the water, the water will pull all of those molecules apart or all the atoms apart in some cases um, and disperse them throughout the solution. Um, and so that's what we're talking about today is what those solutions are. And I think, we'll, I think we do talk more about um, how especially water is able to solubilize other uh, solids. So a solution is a ho homogeneous mixture of two or more substances. Solutions are common for the most, or they're common. Most of the liquids and gases that we encounter every day are actually solutions. It's really, really hard to get perfectly pure water, to get just H2O. You have to use multiple phase reverse osmosis, and it's just an absolute pain. Um, partly because there's sodium on everything. I don't know if you knew that, but there's, there's sodium on absolutely everything. And if you've ever seen glass blowing, the... Um, as you heat up glass, you get a bright yellow light, and that's not from or a bright yellow flame, and that's not from the glass. That's actually sodium burning off the glass. Uh, but that's a topic for something else. Uh, so, like the ocean is a solution of salt and other solids dissolved in water. You might have heard of like sea salt. Um, that's just not it's not just sodium chloride. There's also magnesium chloride, other ions that give it its slightly different taste. And our blood plasma is also a solution. Um, so if you take the blood cells out of it, there's other different solids and gases that are dissolved in, in that solution. So solution may be composed of a gas and a liquid, a liquid and another liquid, a solid and a gas, or other combinations. Really, if you have one thing dissolved in another thing, that's a solution. So you can talk about solutions, uh, yeah, it's gas, gas, gas liquid, liquid liquid, liquid solid, and even solid solid. So alloys. Um, you kind of take this for granted, but a lot of the steel, a lot of the metal things that we use every day are alloys. And those are solutions of two metals mixed together as a solid. Now they're mixed together um, as liquids first, but after they solidify, there's still a solution. The solution has at least two components. There has to be a solvent, which is the majority of the of the or is the majority component. Right? So our, your glass of water, the water is the um, solvent, and then the solute, which is the minority component. Right. So if you take, um, if I took some sugar and put it into the water, the sugar would be the solute. It's a little bit confusing because those words are just similar enough uh, <clears throat> to mix up. Uh, in a solid liquid solution, the liquid is usually considered the solvent, regardless of the relative proportions of the components. Uh, one example would be sugar. You can put a greater mass, you can dissolve, let's say you have 50 grams of water. You can dissolve more than 50 grams of sugar in the water. Which is why you can put so much sugar into soda, especially if you use high fructose corn syrup. Um, but in that case, since we're dissolving a solid in a liquid, we still consider the liquid to be the, sol the solvent. The most common solutions are those having water as the solvent, and they're called aqueous solutions, right? That's why we write, write the little um, AQ next to our, um, our reactants or our products in a chemical equation. Other solvents are also used, especially to form solutions with nonpolar solvents or solutes. So that could be things like hexane, uh, octane, all these different length carbon chains, um, oils you can use uh, to dissolve nonpolar solutes. And sort of the overall, the overarching principle is that like dissolves like. 
So if you have something that's polar, um, it will dissolve in a polar solvent, or a polar solvent, I should say, will dissolve a polar solute, and a nonpolar solvent will dissolve a nonpolar solute. <clears throat> so some common polar solvents would be water, acetone, uh, methyl alcohol, ethanol would be another polar solvent, um, and then your common nonpolar solvents would be things like hexane, diethyl ether, uh, toluene. Uh, that's kind of getting a little bit more into uh, organic chemistry in t terms of why those are polar or nonpolar. Um, but if you drew out or if you Googled the structures, you could figure out uh, why they're polar or nonpolar with stuff that you've learned in this class. <clears throat> so there's a competition between the solvent solute attractions and the solute solute and the solvent solvent attractions. Right? So this is what I was talking about when you put. Uh, something like sugar into water. Um, not all ionic compounds are soluble in water. So something like calcium carbonate, the attractions between the calcium and the carbonate ions win, and the solid does not dissolve. So you have to look at the attraction here, and is that attraction greater than these attractions here? And if, if these ones, if you're water to your ion attractions are greater, that will break this and pull it apart, and that's what makes something soluble, at least in water. But if you have a stronger attraction, like in calcium carbonate, if you have a stronger attraction between your two ions, then these attractions will not be strong enough to break apart those um, formula units and dissolve them in the solution. Water is, water is, is a special solvent um, because of the strength of its bonds that it can form. Uh, so the positive ends of the water dipoles are attracted to the negatively charged ions, and the negative ends of the water dipoles are attracted to the positively charged ions. And you can see that over here. So we have our, we'll use red for positive, so we have hydrogens, which are positive, all facing inwards towards this negatively charged chlorine ion. And so that creates a barrier around the chlorine ion so that it can't interact with the sodium ion. And then the opposite is true, right, for sodium. We have, oops, we have all these negatively charged oxygens on the dipole of the uh, water and then we have a positively charged sodium. And so you get this, um, not just a two-dimensional ring around that, but you get actually a three-dimensional sphere of water, ion, or of water molecules surrounding each ion, preventing it from interacting uh, with its uh, opposite component. So in a solution of sodium chloride, the sodium and the chlorine ions are dispersed in the water. If you remember, we talked about um, net ionic equations, where you actually take those ions and separate them. So if we put, you know, sodium chloride into water, because you could say plus H2O. No, I won't say plus H2O, because the water is just everywhere. It's ubiquitous. It's not really a reactant. But we break up those sodium and those chlorine ions, because they each get surrounded by water molecules. And then you can use that to see okay, what molecules are actually, or what atoms or molecules are actually interacting, right? And we cancel those out to get only the ones that are important for the reaction. Mostly in terms of uh, precipitation reactions, we did those. So the water molecules surround the ions of sodium chloride and disperse them into solution. So they're coming in and they're pulling off these ions, right? And as they pull off more of those ions, they get further in until the entire thing is dispersed. So the solubility of a compound is defined as the amount of compound, usually in grams, that dissolves in a certain amount of liquid. So for salt, table salt, sodium chloride, at 25 degrees C, because we'll learn that temperature is important when you're talking about solubility, we, get, we can get 36 grams in 100 grams of water. So a solution that contains 36 grams of sodium chloride per 100 grams of water is a saturated 
sodium chloride solution. That means we've, we've put in as much sodium chloride as we can, and if you add more sodium chloride than that, you'll actually get sodium chloride on the bottom that does not dissolve because the water has no more capacity to pull apart those ions and surround them. So a saturated solution holds the maximum amount of solute under the solution conditions. And that, that temperature there is important. So if we have an unsaturated solution, unmeaning not, that contains less than the maximum amount of solute. If we add additional solute, uh, it will dissolve. A supersaturated solution holds more than the normal maximum amount of solute. And the solute will normally precipitate from, or come out of, right, we talked about precipitations, a supersaturated solution. Supersaturated solutions can form under special circumstances, such as the sudden release of pressure that occurs in a soda can when it is opened. So that, that CO2, the carbon dioxide that makes your soda fizzy, is actually stored, or is actually contained in a supersaturated state. Oh yeah, these are cool. So this is um, sodium acetate. Oh, cool, it did work. All right, so this is a supersaturated solution of sodium acetate. And they're going to take a, um, a scooper, a little metal spatula, and stick it in there. And as soon as you give the sodium acetate something to solidify on, to concentrate on, it'll take that opportunity um, and start forming these crystals. And so what you're seeing here is the actual um, crystals forming in real time. And so those um, molecules, or the, the sodium and the acetate, are sticking together. And as they stick together, they create more surface area for more sodium acetate to start sticking. And they start aligning in these huge crystal structures. I think that's the end of that one. I've got another one here. So you don't just have to put it into the... Oh, I ran into this problem earlier, too. Hold on. that again. It won't let me full screen. Anyways, so right here they take uh, some toothpicks and put them in a super saturated sodium acetate solution. You can see just how quickly that forms a solid and generates a lot of heat. Yeah, it just won't let me. Sodium acetate is so cool, right? And then it's hard. It's just completely filled up. So you can also take this, and you can, I think that's the next one. You can take that sodium acetate uh, as a supersaturated liquid and start pouring it. And as it pours out, it solidifies. Yeah, here it is. And I know it's going to be mentioned later, but this is how you make rock candy. So if you take a, um, a pot and you heat the water up, then you dissolve a ton of sugar in it. Um, you then suspend a string into the uh, solution, right, your sugar solution. Oh, that one's cool. <clears throat> so sometimes it doesn't solidify instantly, and it just needs a little starter. Um, so you suspend your string and your... Uh, super saturated sugar solution and as it cools down the solubility lowers and it creates um, crystals of sugar on the string so you get rock candy okay so solubility rules give us a qualitative description of the solubility of ionic solids right qualitative meaning um, we know that Something will happen, but we don't know how much of it we need for that to happen. Um, this is the difference between qualitative and quantitative. Qualitative is um, qualify. We make these qualifiers. So if we have uh, calcium uh, plus uh, carbonate, If we combine those two, we'll get a solid. <clears throat> we 
whereas quantify it gives us specific quantities. It's not just des describing a quality, it's describing the quantity. For some ionic compounds like calcium carbonate, they're insoluble because the attraction between ions is greater than the solvent solute attraction, right? So the, the, the um, attraction between the water and the uh, calcium carbonate is a weaker attraction than between the calcium and the carbonate. But we can also have molecular solids that are soluble in water depending on whether the solid is polar. So table sugar is a polar molecule and is soluble in water. Things like uh, nonpolar solids, such as lard and vegetable oil, or vegetable shortening, not vegetable oil. Well, vegetable oil too, but it's a liquid. Uh, they're usually insoluble in water. That's why you need soap, you know, if you get lard all over a pan because you were baking or something. You need soap to clean that off. <clears throat> so electrolyte solutions are a special type of solution that contain these dissolved ions. Um, and they're able to, because of these dissolved ions, they're able to conduct electricity. Non-electrolyte solutions contain dissolved molecules and do not conduct electricity. So sugar, sugar is soluble. Um, just abbreviate this. It's soluble because it's polar. Sodium chloride is soluble because it's ionic, and those ionic bonds are weaker than the ones to water. Um, right, so if you have charged particles, something like sodium chloride, magnesium chloride, um, I guess calcium carbonate is not solid, uh, but sodium carbonate, um, you have all these ions in solution instead of uh, uncharged neutral particles, and those can conduct electricity. So the keys here being charged, <clears throat> excuse me, give me this, charged particles versus neutral particles. That's the difference between your electrolyte and your non-electrolyte solutions. <clears throat> so, right, we mentioned a little bit before, like I mentioned that uh, if you want to make rock candy, then you need to heat the water up. And our solubility uh, is dependent on increasing, or is dependent on temperature. And as we increase temperature, we increase the solubility in general. We increase the solubility of different solids in water. But you can see that the temperature dependence of solubility varies a lot. You've got stuff like sodium chloride, which takes like a relatively straight line across here. So its solubility doesn't increase much. And then on the extreme end, you have something like uh, potassium nitrate, whose solubility increases immensely as you increase temperature. And then you get all this, all the lines in between as well. Um, also note that some of these increase linearly. So like lead nitrate has a straight line without a curve, whereas potassium nitrate or potassium chlorate have these curved lines. So the relationship, or not potassium chloride, um, potassium chromate, have these curved lines. So their solubility is not linear. So as you increase the temperature, you get more and more um, solubility rather than just a one-to-one -one relationship. We can use uh, the solubility of different solids um, to separate out and purify stuff from reactions that we've done. And if you were, you know, doing the lab in person, uh, actually, let me think about this. I don't think there's a lab in Gen Chem where you do this or not in 3A. If you take organic chemistry, you'll probably do a recrystallization. So whenever you make a compound in organic chemistry, you need to purify your compound after the reaction. One of the ways you can do that is recrystallization. Um, and you do the recrystallization, whether by um, preparing it at an elevated temperature. So you can uh, saturate your, you can make a saturated solution, prepare it at an elevated temperature, and as it cools, the solubility decreases causing some of the solid to precipitate, precipitate from the solution. Uh, and then if the solution cools very slowly, the solid will form crystals as it comes out. And the crystalline structure tends to reject impurities, resulting in a purer solid. I wanted to do a demonstration where I had something like 
uh, Legos suspended in Orbeez. I don't know if you know what Orbeez are. They're those, like, um, I think they're basically what, like, silica gel is. But you saturate them with water, and so you get this, like, these really squishy, they're fun. Kind of like boba. But imagine you've got a beaker full of Orbeez, and you've got a bunch of Legos sort of suspended and distributed throughout there. If you were to slowly take those Legos and put them together inside of the Orbeez, you would be excluding the Orbeez from that crystal structure, because that's essentially what's happening is the ions, or the solid, starts to bond together and stick together, and it forms a crystal structure. Um, if you were to take those Legos and just smash them together, you'd probably smash some Orbeez in there inside of your Legos. Um, so that's the difference between dissolve or crystallizing something slowly and crystallizing something quickly. Um, but it is a great way to um, purify solids if you can use it. Recrystallization can be used to make rock candy, right? I mentioned this earlier. So prep, you prepare a saturated sucrose table sugar solution at an elevated temperature. Uh, probably don't want to boil it too much. You don't want to caramelize the sugar, or maybe you do. You could try that. And then you dangle a string in the solution. And um, I was just trying to think if you can caramelize sugar at boiling temperature. I don't think so. Anyways, you dangle a string in the solution and leave it to cool and stand for several days. It takes a long time for it to crystallize out. But as it cools, uh, it becomes super saturated, and your sugar crystals grow on the string, and then you've got just rock candy. Um, so we've talked now about a lot about solids dissolved in liquids, but you can also have gases dissolved in liquids, um, just like a soda can. And most liquids exposed to air actually contain some dissolved gases. Um, you've probably noticed this if you've gone and, especially tap water will do this, you fill up a glass with tap water or from the hose, I guess the hose especially, and you'll see that it looks cloudy and murky, but if you leave it for a while, uh, that cloudy murkiness goes away. And that is because that murkiness, that haziness of the water is actually, well, I won't say it's every situation. If you know your water's clean already, and if you live in a city, probably is. If you know you've got clean water, then some of that fizz, that murkiness, that um, haziness, is actually from dissolved gases coming out of your water. And so if you leave it for long enough, that will equilibrate all of those gases that uh, want to leave, because they're super saturated, will leave, and you'll get clear water. Um, so lake water and seawater also contain dissolved oxygen, which is how fish breathe um, and how gills work. <clears throat> and our blood contains dissolved nitrogen, oxygen, and carbon dioxide. Even tap water contains dissolved atmospheric gases, as I mentioned. Um, deep sea divers, right, we talked about how they need to use uh, helium instead of, uh, well, he a helium oxygen mixture instead of a nitrogen oxygen mixture. Um, and that's because the nitrogen uh, at higher pressures will concentrate in your blood and cause problems. And then as you leave those high pressure depths, you need to come up slowly so that air bubbles don't form in your blood, which is called the bends. Um, <clears throat> all a result of just dissolved gases in liquids. <clears throat> so you probably noticed too, if you have a soda and it's hot, hot soda, you open it up, it's just incredibly fizzy to the point where it's just not even pleasant to drink um, on top of being hot soda, which is not great. But warm soda fizzes more than cold soda, and it's that extra fizziness because the solubility of the dissolved carbon dioxide decreases with increasing temperature. Um, one of the ways that I think about this that sort of sorts it out in my mind a little bit is that <clears throat> the closer you get to the temperature where both things are liquid, the more soluble it is. So if you think about a liquid, a liquid plus a gas, right? So if you cool down that gas enough, it'll become a liquid. And so the closer these two things are to being both liquids, so cooler temperatures, um, so let's see, I'll write this, right? So if we decrease temp, we increase solubility. 
But if we have, I don't leave myself much space here, if we have a solid plus a liquid, it's the opposite. But <clears throat> if you think about it, if we increase the temperature of that solid enough, it will become a liquid. And so by increasing temperature with solids and liquids, we increase solubility. So as they both become more liquid-like, higher temperatures, they dissolve better. But gases are the opposite. You need lower temperatures to dissolve more of the gas because the gas will want to be more like a liquid at lower temperatures. <clears throat> you can try this at home too. So if you're heating tap water, uh, before it reaches its boiling point, you'll see small bubbles of air, dissolved air coming out of the solution. And as the temperature rises, the solubility of that dissolved air decreases and it comes out of the solution. And that'll happen, and that's why that happens, before you get to an actual boil. Um, and then once you get to that roiling boil, uh, the, bubbling, or the bubbles are composed of water vapor and not dissolved air. <clears throat> so the solubility, this is called Henry's Law. The solubility of gases also depends on pressure. The higher the pressure of a gas above a liquid, the more soluble the gas is in the liquid. Um, you can think about this in terms of gradients. You can think about it in terms of pressure. If you think about it, we have all of this pressure above the liquid. And the more pressure there is, it's going to force gases into the liquid to actually decrease that pressure to a small extent. So if you have low pressure over your solution, you're going to have a lower solubility, or you're going to have, really, you're going to have less dissolved gas. So the higher the pressure of a gas above the liquid, the more soluble the gas is in the liquid. The practical application of this is soda, or a soda stream, if you have a soda stream, or if you've seen one. Um, <clears throat> the soda inside the can is pressurized with carbon dioxide. So not only are they adding carbon dioxide into the liquid itself, but when they seal that can up, they add extra CO2 on top. So the gas at the top of the can, that extra space in there that makes you, you know, if you shake it, lets it swish around, that's CO2. And that CO2 is helping hold the CO2 in the liquid, which is why it goes flat if you open it up. It's a super saturated solution. Um, if you have a soda stream, you're sort of doing this, but you're starting with your flat soda water and you're adding pressurized CO2. <clears throat> so when you add that pressurized CO2, you are increasing the pressure of CO2 inside of the, you know, bottle to the point where uh, you're dissolving that CO2 to help relieve some of that pressure and it makes whatever you put in there fizzy. Um, and you could put chocolate milk in a soda stream and get carbonated chocolate milk, which sounds gross. <clears throat> I do want to say, too, so if you've ever had a, uh, at Starbucks, they had nitro cold brews. I don't know if you noticed, the nitro cold brew, that, I won't call it carbonation, but that dissolved gas in there, is smoother than CO2. And it's because it's nitrogen, and it's because nitrogen forms smaller bubbles uh, than CO2 does. So now let's get into a little bit of math. Let's get into the, so we've been talking about the qualitative, you know, why things happen, the qualities of solutions. Um, but we need numbers and we need ways to talk about this more specifically. So first one we're going to talk about is mass percent. And that's simply the grams of solute per 100 grams of the solution. And this is important to note. This is of the solution, not of the solvent. So a solution with a concentrate, concentration of 14% by mass contains 14 grams of solute per 100 grams of solution. All right, again, solution, not solvent. So it's the mass of the solute plus the mass of the solution. And this actually makes it easier to use as a conversion factor. <clears throat> so let's calculate the mass percent of a sucrose solution containing 11.3 grams of sucrose and 412.1 .1 milliliters of water. 
And we're going to assume that the density of water is 1 gram per milliliter, which makes this very, very easy to convert. So we can just take 412.1 and say that's 412.1 grams, because it's a 1 to 1 ratio. So if we have 412.1 grams, H2O, and we want to calculate the mass percent of a sucrose solution, the bottom, the denominator of our equation here is the mass of the solution. So we're going to have 412.1 uh, grams of water plus 11.3 grams sucrose. And then on top, we're going to have 11.3 grams sucrose. <clears throat> and we're going to express this as a percent. So I'll, I'll write up the... Um, I'll write out the proportion first, the decimal number, 11.3 divided by, I'm going to do 412.1, and if you're typing this into your calculator as well, make sure that you separate this addition from the division using parentheses, and that will give us a 0 0.026, get three decimal places, or three significant figures, so 267, um, really, right, this is grams of sucrose per um, sorry, grams of sucrose per really one gram, one gram of, oh, okay, this makes sense now. So, so, okay, so this is, this is per one gram, right? So if we do per one gram of sucrose solution, that got tiny at the end there. This is per one gram of sucrose solution. If we multiply this by 100, we're going to take our 0 0.02 to make a percent, 267 grams And then that's per one gram sucrose solution. What we're really doing is we're multiplying uh, the top and the bottom by 100 over 100. So that our mass percent then is 2.67 grams of sucrose, change the eraser type, 2.67 grams of sucrose, I was really struggling to write, uh, 100 grams of sucrose solution, or, uh, and I've run out of space again, this would also be 2.67% sucrose. Mass percent sucrose. Any questions? Okay. There are some other units that we can use. So parts per hundred. That's kind of what we calculated here um, that's the same as mass percent, parts per hundred, because per cent, cent is Roman or Greek or something for 100, so it's per 100. Uh, then we also have parts per million, the number of grams per of solute per 1 million grams of solution, and parts per billion, which is the number of grams of solute per 1 billion grams of solute, or solution, excuse me. Um, Parts per million and parts per billion can also be used. Um, they're really sort of generic terms. It's just one in a billion and one in a million. So if you wanted to write out, uh, you know, a part per million is one part per one million parts. And then parts per billion is, right, just change that denominator to a billion. 
So we can use this mass percent of a solution as a conversion factor between the mass of the solute and the mass of the solution. The key to using mass percent as a conversion factor is to write it as a fraction. So it's one, one gram or however many grams of solute in 100 grams of solution. And that 100 grams of solution is important if you're going to use the percent and not the proportion. So how much sucrose in grams is contained in 355 mils of a soft drink containing 11.5% by mass sucrose? Assume a density of 1.04 grams per mil. So now we do need to do a little bit of conversion. <clears throat> so a lot of these questions are sort of written, maybe a matter of opinion, maybe a subjective thing. In my opinion, they're written backwards. Um, because we want to find sucrose, but that's first. So sucrose is actually the last thing in our sort of solution diagram because we've been given, oops, I should just write these. Um, we've been given mass percent, and we want to convert that to uh, grams of sucrose. And actually, what we've been given is, because there's another step here, right? We have to go from um, 355 mils to grams to mass percent, then to grams of sucrose. <clears throat> so if we do, we want to do 355 mils, and we want to convert that into uh, grams, then we have to do 1.04 grams per one mil. All right, we get that from our question stem here. Then to convert from grams to mass percent, we're going to write this as a ratio. So we're going to get 11.5 grams of sucrose. I guess we're not converting to mass percent, but we're putting the mass percent in here. This is 100 grams of solution. And that will give us our grams of sucrose. So, and then we're multiplying these. So we can do 355 times 1.04 times 11.5, then divide that by 100. And we get 42 uh, significant figures, right? We got three. 42.5 grams of sucrose, which is about what you would see on the back of the can. Any questions there? Turn my zoom off. Oh, yeah. Good, okay. Uh, so auto frame got turned off. Oh, that turned off the background replacement. I'm telling you, things got, things got weird in the move. Computers don't like being moved. Zoom also just updated. Sorry, what was that? Zoom just updated. Oh, maybe update. that was part of it too. I use a number of things in this stream setup. I'm actually using Streamlabs and NVIDIA Broadcast. And um, if you're curious about any of that and how to set it up, we can talk about that in Discord. Uh, I'd be happy to help. Um, okay. <clears throat> Moving on then. So molarity is another way. So we've, we talked about mass percent. Molarity is the, it's the unit that we're going to use the most when we're talking about solutions. And it's defined as the number of moles of solute per liter of solution. So before we had mass and mass for uh, mass percent. And now we've got moles and liters. Um, and again, like any of these things, we can use this as a conversion factor. And specifically using this equation. Right, so let me just do this real quick before we get into, or actually, let's, let's finish talking about what it is. Um, again, this is moles per liter of solution, not per liter of solvent. Uh, and to, take, to make a solution of a specified molarity, you usually uh, put the solute 
into a flask and then add water to the desired volume of solution. But if we wanted to rearrange this, we could say, well, let me give myself a little bit more because we want to see this. So you can take molarity. We can take, so let's say we want moles, right? So we're going to take liters and we're going to multiply both sides by liters. And so we're going to do liters. Ooh, I wrote it British. Litres. Uh, liters times molarity. That equals moles solute. If we want to go the other way and we wanted liters of solution, <clears throat> it's a little bit more, or if we wanted moles of solution, I should say, sorry, liters of solution, gosh, then we're going to flip flop liters and molarity. So we're going to multiply both sides by liters and then we're going to divide both sides by molarity and we're going to get liters equals moles divided by molarity. Actually, let me re I'm going to rewrite this one so it's a little bit clearer and a little bit less British. Moles equals molarity times liters. <clears throat> And remember, it's liters of solution, not the, just the solvent. So this is what we were talking about on that last note there, where it says that we add our sodium chloride. Let's, make, let's say we want to make a very specific solution of sodium chloride. We want one molar. So we add one mole of sodium chloride, or 58.44 grams. Right? We can pull that from the combination of sodium and chlorine to get the molar mass. <clears throat> we add that into our, this is a volumetric flask. And so it has this line, that may be hard to see, there's this line, and when the solution is filled exactly up to that line, you have exactly, I guess in this case, one liter. And so they make different vo size volumetric flasks for different amounts. Um, so you add it until it, the solid is dissolved, and then you mix it, and then fill up to that one liter mark and mix again. Okay, so let's say we take a, we want to calculate the molarity of a solution made by putting 55.8 grams of sodium nitrate into a beaker and diluting to 2.5 liters. So, all right, so we're starting with grams. Should do more of these solution diagrams. They are very helpful, especially if you find yourself running in circles with units. All right, so we're going to go from grams to moles, and then from moles, uh, we have the number of liters. So we can do capital M, which is molarity. Uh, so first, we need a periodic table. And we need the periodic table with the masses. Periodic table for the masses. I don't know if you guys can actually read that on Zoom, but we have uh, 22.99 for sodium. Is it 14.01 for nitrogen? And then 16.00 according to this one, this periodic table, for oxygen. So let's do 22.99 plus 14.01 plus 16 times 4. Sorry, 16 times 3. All right, so we have 85. Those are 85 grams NaNO3 for one mole. And we're starting with our 55.8 grams, right onto space, and then we're going to divide by um, 2.50 liters. So we just put one over our liters, and that will give us our answer. So we do 55.8 divided by 85 divided by 2.50. This is actually, should uh, be more specific, this is 85.00. So we have three significant figures, and so our molarity then is 0 0.263 molar. So just, you know, this is why there's that 
big unit analysis worksheet. This is why I was kind of harping on that a lot because it really does carry through to every every part of general chemistry and every part of chemistry really, just constantly converting units. Um, so we can use molarity then as a conversion factor between moles of solute and liters of solution. Um, I'm going to determine how many grams of sucrose are contained in 1.95 liters of 0 0.781 molar sucrose solution. Now we can go back. <clears throat> so we can go back and we can look at this, right? If we want moles, then we multiply molarity by liters. That was a question, right? Moles? Okay, yeah. So to get to grams, right, we... Uh, I guess here we're starting with molarity. And from molarity, we're going to go to moles. And then from moles, we can go to grams using the molecular weight of sucrose. So you can either use that previous table like we saw, or or the previous equation, right? You could write out the equations, and you could memorize the equations. Or you can remember that molarity is moles per liter. And we can take our 1.5 liters, or actually our 0 0.781 molarity. Where is M? All right, so it's moles per liter. So if we multiply by our 1.95 liters, that will give us our moles. So 0 0.781 times 1.95 is 1.52. And then I am not going to calculate that for sucrose. I'm just going to Google it. Three forty-two. <clears throat> so we have moles here, and so we're going to do three four two point three um, grams per one mole. So we can just multiply this by three four two point three, and we'll get five hundred and twenty-one point three grams sucrose. It's a lot of sucrose. Thank you. <clears throat> um, how many liters, then, of a 0 0.225 molar potassium chloride solution contains 55.8 grams of potassium chloride? And again, we can go back and we can look at the equations that I wrote out earlier. We can just remember that molarity is equal to moles over liters. And we know it's very easy to convert from grams to moles or moles to grams and back. So the way to do this one is we're actually going to start with uh, grams. And then because molarity is in moles per liter, we're going to convert them to moles. And then for moles, uh, we can go to liters using our molarity. So potassium is 39.1, 39.10 plus chlorine, which is 35.45. It's one of those that you just sort of remember because it's it's a fun number. 35.45 sticks in my head for some reason. Okay, so we have 55.8 grams KCl, and then 74.55 grams per one mole. And then we use our molarity. So molarity is in moles per liter. <clears throat> and we have moles now as our numerator. So we're going to put moles as our denominator. So we're going to 0 0.225 moles per 1 liter. So we just take 55.8 divided by 74.55 divided by 0.225. And we get 3. 3.33 liters.
So again, it's just a lot of um, a lot of conversion factors. Just remembering what molarity is, remembering what percent mass is, um, and then applying these to uh, the other concepts that we've learned. For example, when we talk about the concentration of a molecular solute usually reflects the concentration of the solute as it actually exists in the solution. So something like sucrose. When we put sucrose into a solution, it's just sucrose molecules, and they're just distributed. But when we talk about the concentration of an ionic solution, um, it reflects the concentration of the solute before it dissolved in its solution. So if we dissolved um, one molar, oh, so if we have a one molar calcium chloride solution, that'll contain one mole of calcium per liter and two moles of chloride per liter. And that's because this is going to, right, if we write the dissolution uh, of calcium chloride as a reaction, we're going to get CaCl2, and that's going to break up into its constituent ions, plus two chlorine ions. So if we look at this, and we then, you know, stoichiometry, right, we're applying... Um, the stuff that we've previously learned to the stuff that we're doing now. So we can see that this is a, you know, a one, one to one ratio between calcium chloride and calcium ions, and it's a one to two ratio of calcium chloride to calcium ions. So if we plug in and we say, okay, you've got one molar, um, let's say we have one liter of this solution, right? How many moles of chlorine do we have? And, you know, if we're using nice whole numbers like this, it's very easy that we can set up then one mole, right, because we're assuming there's one liter. So actually, let's, let's take this a step back, and we'll do it this way. We'll do, we have 1.0 molar CaCl2, and we have one liter, so it's moles per liter, so we just multiply by 1.0 liters, we'll say. Um... That gives us the moles of calcium chloride, and then we just use the ratio that it's 1 CaCl2, just for the sake of having something there, to 2 Cl minus. Right? So then our, do the math here, it's 1 times 1 times 2. We now have 2 moles of chlorine, or chloride ions. Sorry, I just... I just saw my webcam there, and it's like, this is why I've been avoiding plaid. All right. Very similar problem. And if this helps you, too, you could write out this, um, these ionic compounds, right? So you can identify calcium chloride. Again, going back and using the stuff that we've learned already, calcium chloride is a metal and a nonmetal, so it's going to be ionic. Uh, you might want to check your uh, solubility rules. Uh, let's see, I have that here. Right, so we can look at our solubility rules, and we can say, okay, so we've got calcium. Is calcium on this list anywhere? Uh, it is, but only with sulfate. It's on here with sulfur and hydroxide, so not on there. Our chlorine, and chlorine is actually on here, but it's not paired with silver, mercury, or lead. So we know that this is going to be soluble, first of all could be implied too because it says the molar concentrations that we have a 0.75 molar solution of calcium chloride but you know again trying to tie, tie in as many concepts as possible you could write this out and say okay we have CaCl2 just like we did on the previous one we're dissolving it and actually more more specifically solid right to calcium 2 plus aqueous plus 2 Chlorine minus, also aqueous. Really struggled with that Q that time. Okay. <clears throat> so we want to determine the molar concentrations in a 0.75 molar calcium chloride solution. Um, because, cal because molarity is in units of moles per liter, we can do a direct conversion using molarity. So what I mean by that is we can say 0 0.75 molar CaCl2 if we want to convert to molarity of calcium. It's a one-to-one -one ratio, right? 
there's a one coefficient for each of these. This is just stoichiometry. So we say one, um, sorry, capital M, one molar CaCl2 to one molar Ca2 plus. So because molarity, and this is because molarity is units, using units of moles, it's moles per liter, not grams, we can do a conversion like this. And we can just say that the one molar is equal to the one molar, and so we do 7, 0 0.75, and so we have 0 0.75 molar Ca2 plus. And now you can probably guess what the setup's going to be to determine this for calcium, or for, sorry, chlorine. Again, we start with 0 0.75 molar CaCl2, and then we have 1 molar CaCl2, and we have 2 molar Cl um, minus. So we're going to get 1.50 molar Cl minus. So again, anytime that we want to compare the quantities of two atoms or two molecules in a reaction, or really if we want to compare the quantities of them in any scenario, we need to go to moles first. We need to compare them mole to mole, how much is there is of each. Okay. Solution dilution. We often uh, store our concentrated we often store the solutions that we use for labs as concentrated solutions, um, so they take up less space. <clears throat> and these are called stock solutions. Many lab procedures call for less concentrated solutions, so the stock solution must be diluted to the required concentration. And this is done by combining a certain amount of the stock solution uh, with water. So if, let's say we have a something like a 4 molar sodium chloride solution. And for the lab, we only need 0 0.1 molar sodium chloride. So that's what we're going to talk about now, is how do we get from 4 molar to our 0 0.1 molar. <clears throat> we use this equation, M1V1 equals M2V2. So M being molarity and V being volume. Um, and you just have to make sure that the volumes of each are using the same units. So let's say that we want, um, we have a 4.0 molar stock solution of sodium chloride, and we need, let's say we only need 100, let's say we need 1 liter, 1 liter of 0 0.1 molar NaCl. Okay, so we've got, let's see, we've got a mass, oh, that's not the eraser, mass, or sorry, not mass, molarity. There are starting molarity. Uh, and the question is, what volume do we need? Excuse me, come back here. So what volume do we need? Y. Okay. And then we also have a known molarity here. Oh, I'm going to use the same color for molarity. All right, known volume that we want of this 0 0.1 solution, molar solution. Excuse me. And then, uh, so, right, so then we have this ending molarity that we want to get to. So now we just solve for V2. So we do 1 times 0 0.1 and then divide that by 4. So 0 0.1 divided by 4. We're going to need V2 will equal 0 0.025 liters of our concentrated. NaCl. All right, so our Isn't stock solution. Sorry, was that? Isn't it V1? You have V2? Oh, yeah, I do have V2. Sorry, yeah. V1. Yes, V1. Could just be V, right? It's just a placeholder. So this, yeah, and this equation works because the molarity multiplied by the volume gives us the number of moles of our solute, which is the same in both solutions. It's just the quantities that change.
Uh, yeah, and this M1V1 equals M2V2 applies only to solution, solution dilution, not to stoichiometry. Uh, and then just as an aside, uh, if you guys take further chemistry courses, which I hope you do, uh, when you dilute acids, you always add the concentrated acid to the water. Uh, you never add water to the concentrated acid solutions. And this is because as those acids uh, dissolve or become miscible in the water, they generate a crazy amount of heat. Um, and if you add water to the concentrated acid, that water will boil almost instantly and then spray concentrated acid everywhere. And nobody wants that. So if we have a six molar sodium nitrate solution, how much of that sodium nitrate solution do we need to make a 0 0.58 liter solution of 1.2 molar sodium nitrate? All right, so it's just M1V1 equals M2V2. So our M1, 6.0 molar, NaNO3, and then V1 equals 0 0.585. Well, put these in order. 1.2 molar. Right, so those are M2, V2, M1, V1. Take a little detour. So you just do 1.2 times 0 0.585 and then divide by 6. So V1 equals 1.11. Sorry, 0. 0.7 mole liters. Right, so this kind of highlights too, though, how you don't need, you need a very, very small amount of the concentrated solution to make a diluted solution. So again, we just use a, we use volumetric flasks for this kind of task. Um, we add that requisite amount of our concentrated stock solution, and then we add uh, water to dilute to the proper volume. So in reactions involving aqueous reactant products, it's often convenient to specify the amount of reactants or products in terms of their volume and concentration. We can use the volume and concentration to calculate the number of moles of reactants or products, and then use stoichiometric coefficients to convert to other quantities in the reaction. So the general solution map for this kind of problem, or this kind of calculation, would be volume of A, moles of A, moles of B, volume of B. Right again, so we're going, we're always going to moles to compare these two things, and when we go from moles of A to moles of B, then we use the stoichiometric coefficient there, from the uh, reaction equation, or the chemical equation, uh, to make that calculation, to make that conversion. <clears throat> so how many milliliters of 0.112 molar? Sodium carbonate will completely react with 27.2 milliliters of 0 0.135 molar uh, nitric acid, according to the reaction. So, again, this is where you can't use M1V1 equals M2V2. You might think that because we have a molarity. Right, they have molarity here, they have a volume, and the molarity, and we're looking for a volume, but we first have to use these uh, stoichiometric coefficients, or the coefficients from our reaction. Um, <clears throat> just trying to think about how to logically lay this out. Uh, okay, so we need to go from, well, let's, let's think, what, what, what can we calculate moles for first? We do not know how much because the question is how many milliliters of our sodium carbonate will completely react with our nitric acid, but we do have molarity and a volume for nitric acid. So what we can do is we can start with that. Again, right, we're going from 
what was it? Volume of A to moles of A. So we have uh, 27.2 milliliters HNO3. We're going to use the molarity of that. And actually, we need to convert this first to liters because molarity is in moles per liter. Uh, so easy conversion. It's going to be 0 0.027 um, to liters. And then we're going to multiply by, we're going to use our molarity, right? And so molarity. And since we have moles over liter in molarity, we're just going to use this straight up without flipping it, without dividing by one, or taking one divided by the molarity. It is zero, 0 0.135 molar. And that's going to go from, again, mils to, well, really, moles. So then our moles will be here, and then we'll take those moles, and we would need to convert them from moles of nitric acid, because we're using 27.2 mils and the molarity of nitric acid. So we've calculated the moles of nitric acid. We want to go from moles of nitric acid to moles of calcium, or sorry, sodium carbonate. So we have, we want moles, we want one mole, Na2CO3, divided by two moles, HNO3. Okay, so we get, then we've gone from moles to moles. And then for moles, we want to know milliliters. That's important to note. There were a couple questions on the test where I forgot to put the units that I was looking for. I gave points for those. Uh, it was specifically one asking for, uh, it was converting temperature, and I didn't say whether to make that temperature at the end in Kelvin or in Celsius. I accepted both. Um, so now we'll go from moles of our nitric acid to sodium carbonate. Uh, and so we'll use our uh, 0 0.112 molar Na2CO3 because we want to know how much of this over 1. Or again, this, is, this would be moles on the bottom, liters on the top because we inverted it. And that will give us our liters of, let's just do this math right here while we're at it. 0 0.0272 times 0 0.135 is that divided by 2 divided by 0 0.112. So we're going to, oops, we're going to have 0 0.016. Uh, again, since we, well, actually, we're only going to multiply this by 1,000 to get milliliters, so we can use our correct number of significant figures here, which would be three, six, four uh, liters of Na2CO3 solution. And so then we multiply by 1,000 milliliters per one liter. Because our final answer, we want to be in milliliters, and we're going to have 16.4 milliliters of our Na2 2CO3 solution. Cool? All right. Um, let's take a quick break actually before diving into this problem. And if you want to get into that, go ahead. But let's take five minutes. Um, Come back at 1126.
Okay. Webcam back on. Here we go. Um. All right. Did you work this out? Did you beat me to it? No, I just got back and started it. <laughs> All right. Fair enough. <clears throat> so, we have a 25 mil sample of nitric acid solution. Requires 35.7 mils of 0 0.18 molar sodium carbonate to completely react with all the nitric acid in the solution. What is the concentration of the nitric acid solution? Let's kind of flip things around a little bit. Uh, this is an example of... now. You might have noticed that this is the reaction that we had on the previous page. But if you were to get this uh, question, the first step is that you should take is to start writing out a reaction equation because you're going to need those stoichiometric coefficients to convert. Um, right, so we're going to get H2CO3 plus NaNO3. So this is a you know double. It's really a. Um, it's kind of an acid neutralization. It's more of a double replacement reaction. Let me just make sure I did this right. Oh, I didn't do it right. Oh, because we're gonna get we're gonna get carbonic acid. Oh, for shame. So this actually decomposes, and we're going to get, we are going to get NaNO3, got that part right, but we're also going to get CO2 plus H2O. So a little bit harder to balance, but nothing too crazy. We do have two sodiums, so we're going to need two NaNO3s, that's for sure, and because we have two of those, we're going to need two nitrates. Now we have two waters or two hydrogens. We have two hydrogens on the right side. We have one carbon and we have three oxygens. So it looks like we're balanced. <clears throat> I did notice on, was it this last exam? Was it the previous exam? There was a lot of difficulty with, oh no, it was a worksheet. I'll go over that at the end of this. Or no, I'll go over that tomorrow. So you need to talk about double replacement reactions. Okay, so 25 mil sample of HNO3. So we want to know the concentration of HNO3. And again, we need to go right from mils of whatever we have to moles, then to moles of whatever we're looking for. Uh, and then we can use that to, to figure out what the question is asking, or, or to solve the question. So we start with, we start with not swapping the page. Um, again, 35.7 mils, we need this to be in liters. So 0 0.3, sorry, 0 0.0357 liters of Na2CO3. Multiply that because we have moles per liter. So we're looking for moles. We're going to do 0 0.108 molar Na2CO3. Then we're going to use our ratio here. So we have... 1 Na2CO3 to 2 nitric acids, because we're looking for nitric acid. You could use this to find the concentration of anything, or you could use it to find how much CO2 gas we made, or how much water. But we're interested in the nitric acid here. So we're going to have 1 Na2CO3 or 2 HNO3. Uh, and that will give us then moles of HNO3. And then from there, once we have moles, we can divide by liters to get molarity, which is a measure of concentration. So we had 0 0.025, again, just converting on the fly here from milliliters to liters. So that should be the end of your setup. 0 0.0357 times 0 0.108 times 2 divided by 0 0.0250 to get uh, 0 0.308 molar 
HNO3. So remember, you're always trying to figure out how you get to moles. And then you can use moles and your stoichiometric coefficients to convert to anything in your reaction equation. No questions there? There was one. I got three points earlier. I don't know where that occurred. You got, sorry, what was that again? 3.08? 3.08. Did I, let me double check and make sure I typed everything into my calculator, right? Mm -hmm. Let's say I had 0 0.357, 0.108, then times two, then divided by, you might have just, I don't know if on your calculator, if you can check to see if you missed a decimal Yeah, I can somewhere. see all my numbers. Yeah. And you have the same numbers that I typed in here. Yeah, 0.357 times 0 0.108. 0 0.0357. If you had 0 0.357, that would, that would be why. Or if you didn't use 0.0250. I used that one. I guess, yeah, it was the first. It was the first one. Yeah. Yeah, usually if, I mean, it's nice when you can see the answer, right? So when you do the homework, you can see like, oh, I was off by a factor of 10. Because right? 3.08 would be off by a factor of 10. Then that's usually, you just missed a zero somewhere between a decimal place and, yeah. Cool. All right, so colligative properties. Colligative properties depend on the number of dissolved solute particles and not on the type of the solute particles. So adding a non-volatile solute to a liquid extends the temperature range over which the liquid remains a liquid. So this is called freezing point depression and boiling point elevation. Adding salt to ice lowers the melting point and adding ethylene glycol to water raises the boiling point and lowers the freezing point. That's antifreeze. Antifreeze is ethylene glycol and I think propylene glycol. And then salt is frequently used, especially in the Midwest or areas where it freezes, um, to keep the roads from freezing. It also destroys your car because it increases the oxidation of the metals that make up your car. But, you know, you win some, you lose some. So, um, right. These properties, colligative properties, are only dependent, I need to back up and make, make this, highlight this, right? depend on the dissolved solute particles, the number of dissolved solute particles, and not the type of solute particles. So if we add sodium chloride, that's going to increase, um, increase the boiling point and decrease the freezing point. If we add sugar, that's going to increase the boiling point and decrease the freezing point. Anything that we add is going to have this effect, this freezing point depression and boiling point elevation. So it's increasing that range where we're a liquid. For freezing point depression and boiling point elevation, again, the concentration of solution is usually expressed in molality. I don't like this unit, <laughs> but it's an important unit. So it's the number of moles of solute per kilogram of solvent. Not solution, per kilograms of solvent. So it's just the solvent involved. So if we did like uh, sodium chloride in water, if it was 50 grams of salt, sodium chloride in 100 grams of water, that would be kilograms of solvent on the bottom. So 0 0.1 kilograms of water. So let's see, we just did, oh, let's do it in terms of kilograms. So we have 0 0.5 kilograms, or sorry, Again, moles on top. So if we had, you know, one mole NaCl over, um, you know, 10 kilograms of H2O, just the H2O. Okay, so if we calculate the molality, a solution containing 50.4 grams of sucrose 
and 0 0.332 kilograms of water. Again, molality, lowercase m, is moles solute over kilograms solvent, not solution. So we can convert again. We take our 50.4 grams of sucrose and we're going to divide by 342.34 grams per one mole of sucrose. So 50.4 50, 50 divided by 342.34 And we're going to get one, sorry, 0 0.147 moles sucrose over 0 0.332 kilograms H2O. Now look at this, 0 0.443 molal molal, just don't like it, molal uh, uh, sugar solution. Not very well written. What is that sound? Really annoying banging sound outside. Okay. So the freezing point depression of a solution uh, we can find with this equation, right? Because it only depends on the amount of particles, the number of particles that are in the solution. So our delta Tf, delta means a change, our change in freezing temperature, so temperature and the F is freezing, the change in freezing temperature in degrees C from the freezing point of the elevation is the molality of the solution uh, times our freezing point depression constant. So depending on the solvent, things are going to have different values of Kf, but like for water example, Kf will always be the same. It's just that's, that is the Kf for water. It's like when we talk about the heat of vaporization for water or the heat of condensation or the, um, wow, heat of fusion. That's what I was looking for, heat of fusion. It's a constant. Oh, take that back a little bit actually because the heat of fusion and the heat of vaporization are dependent on temperature. Sorry. Um, so, but Kf, Kf is not dependent on temperature. So we calculate the freezing point, uh, calculate the new freezing point of an aqueous solution, aqueous 2.6 molal, molal solution of sucrose. Okay, so it's just our um, molality. So let's write out the equation because there's not much to do here. We're going to have delta Tf is equal molality times oops, Kf. And you'll see why this works because we have molality in units of, and I'm going to write these out in, in its units, right? So we have moles sucrose, uh, and this is in water. Oh, aqueous, right? So it tells us it's aqueous, so that's in water. 2.6 moles of sucrose um, in one kilogram of H2O, right? Again, it's just the solvent. And we're going to multiply that by RKF, which is 1.86, and that's degree C times kilograms of solvent over mole of solute. So you can see that this is our moles of solute. I'm going to do that. Moles of solute is going to cancel out with moles of solute. Moles of solvent or kilograms of solvent will cancel out with kilograms of solvent. And we're going to get some degree C as our answer. So we'll do 2.6 times 1.86. And that's going to be, just really Spotify is probably still playing. Um, that is going to be 4.8. Uh, we only have two significant figures. So 4.8 degrees C. So that's going to be 0 degrees C 
is a normal freezing point for water minus 4.8 degrees C so that our new freezing point of water which we can call TF is now negative 4.8 degrees C. So it's asking us here, right, be very careful with what the question is asking for. It says calculate the freezing point of this solution. So we need to go all the way to this step, and that is our answer. She's come in to say hi. Boiling point. I just show you guys mochi. Everybody. Look at this fluffy guy. Doesn't like your face, dude. All right, cat break. So the boiling point of a solution uh, containing a non-volatile solute is higher than the boiling point of the pure solvent, right? So we talked about that before, but in automobiles, antifreeze not only prevents the freezing of coolant in cold temperatures, but it also prevents the boiling of engine coolant in hot temperatures. And we calculate the boiling point elevation in pretty much exactly the same way. The only difference that we're using Kb, which is the boiling point uh, elevation constant. And again, molality, we have Kb, and then it's delta Tb, right? So change in temperature boiling. So we have a 3.5 molal glucose solution, and we have our Kb, so we're gonna take 0 0.512 as our Kb, and that's in degrees C kilogram solvent over moles of our solute. And we're gonna multiply that by 3.5 molal glucose so that our boiling point elevation 0 0.512 times 3.5 is 1.7 I guess 1.8 degrees C so then our new boiling point because the regular boiling point of water is going to be 100 degrees C plus 1.8 degrees C to give us 101.8 degrees C. All right, pretty simple, not too crazy. You could calculate, and this is the kind of question that I might ask on a test. Uh, give myself a little bit more room here. Actually, I'm gonna take this. We're gonna shrink them a bit and move them over here. Because now I could ask the question, okay, what is, what is the Kb of a solution of glucose? Um, Kb of a solution of glucose uh, with an elevated boiling point of, we'll see, how would I ask this question? Yeah, so look, we've got an unknown solvent. We don't know what the solvent is. But we want to calculate its Kb, and we've measured its elevated boiling point as, um, 112 degrees C, and its normal boiling point is 108. So this is normal. Ow, ow, mochi. Started clawing my leg. Normal, and then this is our elevated. So if we, if we know the normal and the elevated, then we can get the difference, right? So the difference between these will be our delta T, B. I know you want attention right now, Mochi. So that's 4 degrees C. And then if we know that we have a, let's say it's a 5.3 molal glucose in this unknown solvent, then we just take our equation, delta T, B equals 5.3, or sorry, let me let me write it out, right? Molal times Kb. So to calculate Kb, all we have to do is fill in 4 degrees C equals 5.3 molal 
times kb. And now our kb is going to be equal to 4 divided by 5.3, or 0 0.75. I'll be more careful on an exam. But this would be in units of degrees C per kilogram solvent over mole solute is equal to Kb. Right, so with this equation, I could give you any two of these numbers and ask for the third one. So you could use this to predict the molality of a solution if you had the uh, boiling point elevation and Kb. Uh, I believe this is the lab concept that we're going to talk about is osmosis. Osmosis is the flow of solvent from a less concentrated solution to a more concentrated solution. So osmosis occurs when solutions containing high concentrations of solute draw solvent from solutions containing lower concentration of solute. Uh, this is most relevant uh, with seawater. <laughs> this is why you can't drink seawater. Seawater is uh, here called a thirsty solution. As it flows through your stomach and intestine, that seawater is full of all kinds of different ions. And it actually draws water out of your bodily tissues and dehydrates you. So if you're ever stuck on a desert island, you cannot drink the seawater. It's gross, and your body thinks it's gross for a reason. Um, so you just you can't do that. And that's because it's going to pull out all of the water, make you less hydrated. <clears throat> we can also look at an osmotic cell. So you have this semi-permeable membrane in between that doesn't let water flow freely back and forth. But, or it lets water back and forth, but doesn't let the ions back and forth. So if we have a salt solution on one side, so let's just say that there's um, a salt solution over here, and then we just have regular pure water on this side, the water molecules are actually going to flow through this membrane and fill this side until the pressure, the weight, the mass, well, really the weight, so the force, right, pulling down on these water molecules. <laughs> Mochi, stop it. You're fine. He's got big baby energy. Um, so the osmotic pressure, then, is the amount that the, uh, is the amount of water that will push up on this side to counteract the force of gravity, really, pulling down on it. And so you can make the water level higher on one side of this membrane than on the other side of the membrane. Uh, <clears throat> osmotic pressure, just like freezing point depression and boiling point elevation, is a colligative property. And so it only depends on the concentration of the solute particles and not the type of solute. So you could have salt, you could have sugar, you could have um, anything dissolved into the solution, and that will increase the osmotic pressure. Uh, our, the membranes of living cells act as semi-permeable membranes, just like we saw uh, in this previous example. Uh, they allow sub substances to pass through, but not others. Um, so if you take a living cell and put it into seawater, it loses water through osmosis and becomes dehydrated because of that uh, osmotic pressure. So if you have an isotonic solution, the solute concentration of the surrounding fluid is equal to that within the cell. You get these normal looking blood cells. If you have a hypotonic solution, so that the surrounding fluid is lower in solute concentration, then you get something like B, where we have more water in the blood cells. And you can see that here we've got some, some dimples in these blood cells. That's what a healthy blood cell should look like. These ones you can see that they're, they're filled out, they're fatter. Now, if we have a hypertonic solution, the surrounding fluid is more concentrated, uh, then the water flows out of the cells and really messes up uh, the structure of your blood cells. <clears throat> okay, so that is it for this lecture. Um, are there any questions? <laughs> She's just really into osmosis. Yeah, he got real excited. Okay. Oh, so... Um, ba -ba -ba. Yes. 
So yeah, anyways, that's, that is it for Chapter 13 Solutions. Tomorrow we'll be covering Chapter 14, uh, which I don't remember off the top of my head what it is. Um, acids and bases. Acids and bases. Oh, perfect. Acids and bases is... So Solutions is enough to get you started with Lab 11. Um, acids and bases is what uh, really rounds that out because titration is using acids and bases. But if you know about molarity, you can probably figure out um, the rest of that lab. Yep, and then tomorrow I want to go over some of the stuff that I've seen on the worksheets that I've graded. Um, talk about things like double replacement reactions. So, all right, that's it for so today. We focus on lab 11. Sorry. Do you what suggest we focus on lab 11? Yeah, just it's I don't think it's any harder than any, than the other labs. Um it's just a very important concept. Right. So I would I even that. now take a look at lab 11, read through it, and then that'll give you a better idea for what you need to be looking for in the lectures or in the textbook. Yeah. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. I'll see you tomorrow.